the panelists that we're going to hear from today are uh, Mary Park with Lane Christensen, uh, and she's going to be talking about another a for-profit partnership um, that they're using to reduce their waste. Uh, Diana Glassman with TD Bank and talking, I believe, about TD Forest, uh, and that's a partnership to uh, increase the greening of our cities and uh, preserving natural areas in the U.S. and Canada. Um, Scott Tu, which who changed on me today, he's going to be talking about the Girl Scouts and a partnership that they're doing with the uh, with the Girl Scouts here. And Nat Natalie uh, Dicanol Dic Dinicola, I'm sorry, Natalie. Natalie Dinicola, who with Monsanto, who is uh, talking about a, a really compelling project in Africa, uh, maize, uh, water efficient maize for Africa. So come on up, everyone, and we can have a nice dialogue here. I told them that I wanted everyone to introduce themselves a little bit and uh, say something that might be interesting for people to know that you may not may not be aware of. Uh, as you know, I'm uh, Andrew Watterson, I'm a senior consultant with Brown Flynn. Uh, we're a sustainability and corporate responsibility consulting firm located in Cleveland, Ohio. Ohio and we help our clients uh, do well by doing good. And, um, and with that is finding the right corporate responsibility strategy for their own culture and their own organization, the communities they serve, and the customers that they serve. Uh, a little bit about me, I've been at Brown Flynn for two years. Uh, prior to that, I was the Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of Cleveland, so I've come from the go uh, government sector, uh, and have been in corporate responsibility or sustainability throughout my whole professional career. Um, and something that you might might find interesting about me is uh, I'm a sailor, and I'm an avid sailor. And the first thing I did, I was 16 years old, and I told my parents that when I graduated from co college, I was going to cross the Atlantic. And uh, I did. I left two weeks after graduation on a 33-foot steel sailboat that I fixed up throughout college with two friends and sailed from Maine. I went to Bates College in, in, uh, in Maine and uh, sailed to Newfoundland, uh, Ireland, England, France, Spain, Portugal, and to spend a year learning about who I was and what I wanted to do in life. Um, so one of, the, one of the requirements for me on where I work and live is that there's a large body of water uh, <laughs> nearby so that I can get away and sail. So if it's a windy day, sometimes I ask uh, my bosses if I can go for a, a little trip in the afternoon. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, um, how about we start just in order here with Diana. Diana, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm uh, Diana Glassman. I'm head of TD Environment for the U.S. operations of uh, TD Bank Group, which is based in Toronto. I guess I'll start with my, my little piece about myself, and then I'll tell you a little bit more mm -hmm. about, um, about our bank. Uh, I grew up in Manhattan. I'm one of the few, and uh, it was a different time. Many of you remember the city going down and up. Um, my parents were immigrants from completely different parts of the world, and uh, so we didn't have much money to go out to the Hamptons or any of that sort of stuff. Um, I grew up in Coney Island, basically. Um, that's where we spent our summers, and for those of you who don't know it, it's a wonderful part, historically 50s, 60s, 40s, 30s Americana, and um, it suffered a lot during Hurricane Sandy, um, but I've gone back again and now bringing my own family to Coney Island, which I love very much. Thank you. Um, that's about me. Um, with regard to TD Bank, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it is um, a top 10 retail bank in the U.S. It has about 1,300 stores, as we call them, branches up and down the East Coast. And um, its focus on the environment is two publicly announced commitments, one to reduce our greenhouse gases by 25% per employee and also to reduce our paper consumption by 20%. Our another initiative, and I'll talk about all of this in my call, is really to embed environment in anything, we, everything we do. Um, and that is primarily starting with infusing environment to our culture. Um, and that uh, relates to our environmental employee engagement program. Terrific. And uh, Scott, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the elevator speech of Ingersoll Rand. Sure. Elevator speech of Ingersoll Rand, uh, the global and di diversified industrial company, um, 140 years old, we do many things for commercial buildings like this hotel, including train air conditioning. We do a lot of things in the industrial setting, air, compress air compressors and uh, pneumatic tools that uh, are the zit zit that you hear when you're watching NASCAR. <laughs> and um, we also are claim to fame for things, uh, we still hold the patent for things like the jackhammer, the rock mm -hmm. drill that transformed the mining industry, and many other things such as uh, Von Duprin devices, which are the 
the brass push um, um, on the door to, to the egress of the building. So these kind of things, exactly correct? those yeah. push bars. Yeah. Uh, so a host of diversified products uh, for around the world. Uh, Fifty-five thousand employees, and we sell products uh, around the world. A little bit about me personally. You may not know. Uh, you'll know now. Eight generations before me, all farmers uh, in the U.S. Uh, along the East Coast mainly row crops and commercial produce. Um, I'm the first generation that uh, is not a farmer. I was a proud president of my Future Farmers of America chapter, and uh, I've stayed as close as I could be in the corporate environment to farming. So I lead sustainability globally for um, Ingersoll Rand, and my background is uh, environmental science, in particular plant science. Terrific. Maybe Natalie here can convince you to go back into farming. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Natalie Di Nicola. I'm uh, I lead sustainable agriculture partnerships and corporate affairs for Africa um, in Monsanto Company. I'll start with a little tidbit about myself. I spent three months camping on the North Slope of Alaska, studying uh, bird habitat, and I was really passionate about um, continuing that and got a degree in environmental toxicology planning to study the effect of environmental toxicants on birds. The research funding I could find was to study fungal toxins in chicken feed, which wasn't exactly what I had in mind, but it did introduce me to the world of agriculture and the profound impact that has on the environment. So I'm actually very grateful for that sort of twist and turn. Uh, Monsanto, for those who might not be familiar, is a company 100% focused on serving farmers. and. Um, we really apply advanced scientific techniques to try to develop better seeds, better information that will help farmers be able to produce more harvest while conserving natural resources and benefiting themselves, their own livelihoods, and their communities. Thank you. And finally, Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Park, and I work for Lane Christensen Company. First, a little bit about our company. We are a water resources construction and drilling management company based now based in Houston, Texas, and we have offices all over the world and in the US. Primarily what we do is provide water resources or drilling services, construction services, and our focus in terms of sustainability is to be the, the leading sustainable solutions provider to the people who utilize and produce those natural resources. Now about me, you know, Andrew said say something about yourself, and um, I grew up in Indiana, which might make you think that I'm a basketball fan, which is true. It's a genetic defect if you come from that <laughs> state, but I um, am not very tall, and so basketball wasn't really in my future professionally, but I was a two-sport varsity athlete in college, not in golf, though. So I'll leave it at that. You can come ask me afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. So uh, with, I asked them maybe about a month ago, I talked to each one of you, and asked them to think about a project, uh, a partnership that they've had, or, or however they want to call it, um, with or an organization or outside that is helping you advance your sustainability efforts or corporate responsibility efforts. But also, uh, if, if the opportunity arises, to talk about some failures and what are the, what are the um, reasons for that. And what do you look for in partnerships when you seek out uh, that, that compelling partner external to your organization to advance your agenda? Um, so they're just highlighting one project and one partnership that we can then have a, a little further conversation on and, and ask the audience on um, and what, you know, what you want to pull out from these experiences. So I can probably go in the same order again. I'll start with Diana and uh, with TD Bank. So Andrew, I'd like to ask you four questions, which are, I think, relevant to this whole audience. What are the four things that every CEO asks about a program? One, are you making me any money? Mm -hmm. Two, are you saving me any money? Three, what are you doing for my employees? And lastly, what are you doing for my reputation? And that's why we created TD Forests. Um, TD Forests is an umbrella initiative at TD Bank globally um, to bring together our various initiatives 
in paper reduction, protection of outdoor spaces, and bringing environment into the communities where we all live and work. Um, and the common theme around it is measurement, measurement and scalability. And let me give you some examples from each of the components of this program. We have linked our reduction of paper objective. Our goal is, as I said, 20%. The goal is to reduce paper consumption and for what we can't reduce to use sustainably produced paper, but really also to offset the paper that we consume. We try to be innovative about it and we are working with the Nature Conservancy um, to quantify what is the tree value of a piece of paper. They have helped us to develop a methodology to actually quantify what is the tree equivalent of the paper that we are consuming. And for that total number, we are preserving, we're working with them, helping them acquire outdoor spaces that are ecologically important up and down our footprint. The next piece of it is really more on the community side. Um, we are working with um, the New York Restoration Project. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with it here in New York City, their objective is to plant a million trees across the city, really focusing on low and middle income neighborhoods that really need it the most. These are neighborhoods that are suffering from high asthma rates, high pollution, um, generally all the, uh, well, they are um, agricultural, you know, they're distant from good quality food. Um, the goal there is a little bit more difficult to quantify. How do you quantify impact on a community? Um, so that's one thing that we'd like to work on in the future. But in the meantime, it is doing a lot of, we're working with them to do a lot of work in the communities. And really, we believe that green spaces are at the heart of thriving communities. They are not the backdrop. They are not something that beautifies community. They are core and central to what makes a community thrive and that builds the fabric of the social relationships in that community. The third piece we've actually had a lot more success quantifying, I'd say, um, and that is our environmental employee engagement piece, where TD Forest, we are teaching our employees about TD Forests um, with the goal of giving them something they can feel proud of, something they can understand. What we've done from a metrics perspective is we have developed a four-stage model of ever-deepening engagement, head, awareness, heart, the passion factor, hands going out and doing something and tangible. The last piece is the horn factor, making it go viral, talking to other people about it. In fact, um, Net Impact um, and Green Biz, Heather Clancy, who's the author, maybe in the audience, they've written a, a case study on our environmental employee engagement program. One of the key pieces is that we have been able to identify metrics for each of those four stages that are indicators of those four questions that link to the core business, core business objectives. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to tell you a little bit um, more about that later. Um, I guess the one challenge that I'd like to leave all of us with is how do we take the lessons from cross-sector engagement? We're in the corporate sector, we're focusing, the examples I gave focused um, you know, on the East Coast of and Canada, or the United States, and um, I'll give you an example in New York City. But how do we take those learnings and scale them up to the global level? There's something that's working here. We know that, we believe that passionately with all of our hearts. We think we can quantify the impact on at least several dimensions. But how do we extract that so that we can engage the public around the world, get them thinking about natural capital, green infrastructure, get them thinking about how to reduce their carbon emissions, get them thinking about how to reduce the water that we all consume, the energy, the food. Because um, if we do that, then we can really have an impact on the drivers of the water energy food nexus. We can really create sustainable cities if we can bring those pieces together. Um, so pulling out quantifiable, measurable outcomes and figuring out how to take them beyond the corporate sector, beyond these, these relationships, beyond the corporate sector and into the global sector um, is one of the key challenges that we're thinking about. And um, you know, we're, we're looking for answers and anybody here who, uh, who can help us out with that, we'd be grateful to, um, to engage with you. Thank you. And Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about your uh, partnership with the Girl Scouts? 
Um, the best partnerships we found are those that really solve many needs, real needs, inside the company in particular. Without some champions inside the company who can actually uh, agree that there's real value. And, I, and I, like you said, uh, CEOs measure value in pretty predictable ways. But there are other groups in the company that also measure the value of partnerships in other ways. Four years ago, we sort of have a, had a perfect storm inside of our company. We employ thousands of mechanical engineers and um, like good actuaries, and with apologies to the HR people in the crowd, you know, they, they can predict the uh, retirement of certain segments of the employee population. They know what happens this coming year. They know what happens two years from now. So they looked out and they thought, you know, about 10, 15 years from now, we'll be in a crisis stage here. Our current recruiting is never going to, uh, currently what we're doing is not going to fill the pipeline like it needs to do. And, and uh, we also had some community um, needs as well. We needed a program that fit um, across the nation and even worldwide that uh, carried its own brand so that there was some credibility behind it as opposed to some homegrown um, program. And um, at the same time, there was some research that came out, similar to other research you may have seen, that says that um, girls in particular, but all, all kids between the, about the ages of um, seven and 10 years old, uh, will make their, at least they'll make their choice uh, related to a future career path, either for science and math or away from science and math. So it's the STEM research that we've all seen. And STEM to me in itself can be rather boring unless you make it um, unless you make it valuable to the company and make it valuable to community. And so we realized uh, by, uh, that maybe that was the perfect time frame for us and a perfect audience for us to talk to would be the seven to 10 year olds, but we had no current way to do that, nor had the company ever thought about doing that. That's way down the chain. We were, we were just getting really good at recruiting at the university level. So what we did was um, someone inside the company said, you know, I don't think the Girl Scouts has anything um, for seven to 10 year old girls that relates to science. And we contacted Girl Scouts of America, whose uh, Manhattan office we met with first, just to talk about, do you offer anything? And you know, they confirmed that uh, they have nothing because no one's come forward with anything interesting enough to develop a journey, as they call it, which is a multi-year journey, uh, if you know anything about the Girl Scouts program. Um, you, you, you evolve through a journey with all the appropriate badges and uh, with each level uh, you accomplish certain things, you get a badge, means you've learned and are doing things either in the community or your learning's increasing. And so we began to work with the Girl Scouts on a pilot program uh, on energy efficiency, something they, na they now call the energy journey. And in the energy journey you can get badges like BTU crew. Um, and it actually is a journey that talks about how to understand how energy is used in your home, in a building like this one, maybe in the library where your troop meets, maybe in the school gym where your troop meets. And it begins to talk about what's happening in this room right here. How much energy is the, are those lights using? How much energy is the, uh, your phone using when you plug it into the wall to charge it? And it actually teaches them not only the information about that, but they actually can go and audit the building with a little checklist how many lights were on that should not have been on, how much water was being used. And uh, at the end of the journey, they actually present a, um, a, a report out to the building owners. Maybe it's the library, maybe it's the librarian. It could be at the town hall, wherever the troop meets. And it's a fantastic journey that's now gone nationwide. Uh, what it's done for us as a company is it increased our understanding of that age group and the possibilities for reaching them. Uh, number two is it certainly gave us a platform at localizing this program in every community where we have employees, where we have an office, where we maybe just have a single salesperson. And there's a tool there and a, and a way for us to connect our employees to local Girl Scout troops. Um, and it's really, been a, it's really been a great model of a partnership. Thank you. <clears throat> and we've had two uh, domestic examples. And now with Natalie, we're talking about an international example. Sure. Uh, so I, I mentioned the important role that agriculture plays in so many issues that affect society and our planet. And a few years ago, Monsanto made some commitments of sustainable agriculture and what it means to us and how we think we can contribute, um, specifically to help farmers produce more and double the yields of, their, of the core crops that we're, we're developing seeds in. Um, secondly, to help them conserve more, so use a third less resources, even as they're doubling their yields and then improving the lives, not just of farmers in large 
large farmers in developed countries, but also smallholder farmers in developing countries. And we knew very much that partnership was going to have to be a core piece of all of this work everywhere. And some of, some of those are business to business, some are purely philanthropic. I'm going to, the one I'm going to talk about today is what we call cooperative development, which is the messiest kind, but tends to often have the, the greatest impact. And that's where we're really trying to leverage the core of what our business is about in a humanitarian way, but with a long-term <laughs> business intention. So it's, it is a bit more complicated to do, but um, we think in this case has been really impactful. Uh, we launched drought tolerant corn in the United States today using breeding and biotechnology to help farmers be able to use water more efficiently. And that's important here. Um, farmers suffer from drought here and they lose a crop in a season. But we realized uh, about seven years ago when this, when this technology was very early in our pipeline that in Africa when droughts happen, it means they don't eat for a year. And if you look at corn in Africa or white maize in Africa, it's the staple crop for about 300 million people. And I think our friends at Mosaic explained really well some of the challenges those farmers face. These are women farmers, very complex challenges. I wouldn't pretend to say there's one simple answer. But one of the challenges is good seed and fertilizer, which can triple or even quadruple their yields, they're very averse to investing in that because they're afraid they're going to lose that investment to a drought. And they just have so little capital to invest. And so we felt that there was something we should be doing to try to make this technology available in corn, which was a primary business platform for us, in Africa. Um, but we didn't really have the capacity to do it. And we know that agriculture is very local. So we wanted to be working with African scientists on African soil and African varieties. So this Water Efficient Maize for Africa project was born. We knew we wanted it to be led by an African NGO. And um, it's called AATF in Kenya. And we knew that we needed to bring in CIMIT, which is the large, pub, largest public research institution working on corn. And we knew we needed to bring in governments. So Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Mozambique, South Africa, their scientists, their USDA equivalent, are doing a lot of the research. Um, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Howard Buffett Foundation, and the US Agency for International Development are funding it. Um, Monsanto's role is really about um, some of its funding, but most of it is donating a lot of proprietary material. So uh, hundreds of our drought tolerant corn lines from our, our breeding programs around the world, um, a drought tolerance transgene, the one that we launched in the United States this year, um, a transgene that will protect, give built-in protection from insects for the plants, and then the expertise of some of our most senior and experienced research scientists who really could have worked anywhere in the company were seconded into this project. And that turned out, I think, to be a really important piece of it um, because such a, when you're working um, in leveraging your core business in a humanitarian way like this, um, you have to know where that fine line is, that you're able to benefit the project, but also protect your shareholders and your customers. And a, a lot of these experienced employees knew where that fine line was, and they also had a lot of good experience working with different kind of cultures. And if you think about the other partners in this project, CIMIT's mission, for instance, is to develop better seeds as a public good. And our mission is to develop better seeds as a, as a business, um, those are really different cultures, and, it, and it's really uh, important that you're able to work that out and build some trust. Um, the way the project's designed is that the WEMA uh, hybrids that are developed will be available to every seed company in Africa. Uh, Monsanto donated the royal, the, all this technology royalty-free to benefit farmers, but we realized that what we really need is a competitive seed industry, a vibrant seed industry where farmers are getting lots of choices. And if we can bring the whole industry up like that, then we'll duke it out and compete for a farmer's business. But before we can get there, we need to develop a vibrant seed industry where farmers are accessing these lower risk hybrids that give them some insurance so that they feel they can invest in those kind of tools. And um, I'm really excited that the first WEMA hybrids as we speak are being planted in Kenya right now. We'll reach about 35,000 farmers. And about a year from now, we're hoping to have a, an official launch with all five of the um, partner countries. Thank you. And finally, Mary, with the uh, solving a business problem that you have. 
here in the United States. Thanks. Um, we at Lane have are fairly new on our sustainability journey, journey, and as we look inside to figure out what our actual footprint is in order to develop some goals and aspirations for how to reduce our impact across the planet, we realized that we had some gaps in our own ability to track our footprint and our own wastewater and energy input. It's a company that's very diverse and as a result of acquisition, we've grown over the last hundred years, but that means that as we've tried to come together in a more centralized um, organization in the last year, we realized that we had six or seven different systems in play. You know, as of a year and a half ago, we had 27 different business cards. So you can imagine <laughs> trying to bring um, back office systems together to get something in order that would help you, help us to um, be able to pull the information that we need. And so uh, our, our column that we have in our monthly safety, safety newsletter is called Trash Talk. That's for sustainability. And <laughs> I'm going to talk about trash, which isn't very exciting. But when you think about a construction company or a drilling company or water management company, a lot of what we do is build things. And then we have the, the leftover resources that we have to do something with after the fact. So what we realized was that we knew exactly how much we were paying our trash and waste haulers to take our trash away. But we didn't have any idea how much we were sending to the landfill versus how much we were diverting for recycling or other opportunities or scrap metal recycling and things like that. And so we spent the last year trying to come up with the framework and the requirements that we had made for ourselves to partner with a company. So this is a, a, a business to business partnership that would help us and allow us to establish a baseline that we felt was credible. So we're looking for 95% reliability for 90% of our footprint across the company. Right now we're focusing on the US. We have external, uh, outside of the US operations where we're not quite as robust in our ability to track data. But what we ended up with doing was looking for a partner in a waste management company. It, and it turns out it is waste management. But a company that could not only help us to track and weigh how much we were hauling away every every month or every week or every two weeks, but that could help us right size what we were spending, what we were sending to the landfill versus what we were diverting for recycling. Our goal as a company is to have recycling deployed at every office around the country. And you wouldn't think that would be hard, but of 77 locations that we have right now, I think 15 have recycling programs. And many of those are in municipalities or areas where it's mandated. So they have to recycle and that's why they do it. So we're a company with some offices that are very tiny and some that are quite large in terms of our overall footprint. And so waste management has been able to come in and say, we can right size you. We have areas where we can use third party providers. We could be your front end provider. But ultimately what our goal, our primary goal is to establish what our baseline is so that we can establish reasonable reduction plans and set targets for ourselves for having a smaller, smaller impact. And so the process that we've gone through to try to identify that is, like several people have said already, is making sure that we understand what it is we're trying to achieve, who are our stakeholders and what do they want out of it, how does it uh, impact not only our bottom line, what are you saving or earning for me, but is it actually going to benefit us in the long term? And it turns out that there are a lot of things about this partnership that are beneficial across the board, not only for us at a corporate level in terms of our reporting capabilities, but at a local level um, and also for waste management as we move forward with it. So there's a lot about it that's very exciting. You know, you don't think of trash as being exciting and um, <laughs> But it's getting to be kind of interesting to see how we're rolling it out and uh, getting people on board from a stakeholder and an employee point of view to get excitement about it at a local level. Yeah, so bringing in employee, oh, employee abs engagement. Absolutely. <clears throat> Would you describe those as sort of the key attributes of the success of the partnership or why you partnered with them? The, the key success factors in picking waste management, and we had a, a, a fairly long and protracted process to pick them with a lot of input from employees and from different business lines are that there's um, 
alignment with what they're capable of doing and what we're trying to accomplish, that our stakeholders across the company are not only engaged, but that there's a benefit to them in, in setting up the partnership, um, and that ultimately there's a fiscal gain. As, as um, we all know, if your CEO says, well, why are we doing this and where are you saving money or making me money, we're, we're saving money and ultimately we think we'll make more money as a result of this. Um, but there's also a long-term win for, not only for us, long-term with waste management, but a gain for waste management, which made a company of our size appealing to them as a partner. So we really view it as a, as a partnership, not as a contract. Don't come and haul my trash. Help me figure out how to manage this problem and turn it into a benefit as opposed to an issue that I have to manage. It's something that I can leverage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about some of the other panelists? What would you describe as, as uh, the key attributes for the successful partnership? When do you, when do you decide to pull the trigger and, and make that partnership happen? You know, Andrew, um, at our company, there is a very sincere commitment at the top of the house that environment and social responsibility is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, there's unif uniformity around that. There is also a belief in some quarters that um, we, well, everybody knows that it's good for the business. So the senior leadership team knows it's good for the business. Some people are more interested in proving how it's good for the business. So as, as we go about thinking about who we want to engage with, um, it's that focus on results and an analytical rigor. There's a quality for rigor and professionalism that's very, very important. Because while we all know where we're going, we also believe it is important to show results, 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 results along the pathway. Um, and with regard to, for example, our relationship with the Nature Conservancy, we have worked with them on a project. Um, they were requested by the City of New York to help think about rebuilding the Howard Beach neighborhood here, which many of you have heard about was, was devastated by Hurricane Sandy. And as they were thinking about how do you rebuild it? They're looking at natural capital, green capital, and infrastructure capital to protect Howard Beach against rising storm water um, and storms. And by the way, this is true for all coastlines mm -hmm. everywhere around the world. So looking at Howard Beach as an ex at the request of the city as an example. And they were able to think through what about oyster beds? What about sand burn berms? What about sand dunes? What about um, natural vegetation? And all those sorts of things. What is the role of trees? So they've come up with that, but they've also begun to quantify in dollar terms what does that mean for the community. And that is very compelling if you want to scale this up. Similarly, on the relationship with the New York Restoration Project, they know exactly how many people are coming out. We can count how many employees are participating in their initiatives. We can see the community gardens that get cleaned up and, and, and become an integral part of the community. So being able to have those tangible results and finding people who are committed to a long-term vision, very consistent long-term vision, who can actually deliver results along the way, that is the way we build momentum and take sustainability into every person's job in the corporate environment and leverage it and accelerate it into the communities and at the um, broader global level. What we're learning about engagement, the four H's of engagement, is that that's not just about environmental engagement for employees. It's about engagement. It's about engagement of communities. It's about engagement around sustainability. It's around engagement around innovation. It's a model of engagement. And if we can take that and quantify it, it builds on itself because it's by showing real results that you get a lot of the people who are sitting on the sidelines beginning to realize, well, it's good for their business. It's good for their cities. It's, it's, it's a no-brainer because it generates ROI. Mm -hmm. um, that is, um, that comes right back to what are the four questions that every CEO asks? It comes back to what does every city want? It wants revenue. It wants a healthy tax base. And how do you create um, um, relationships cross-sector that actually deliver that. Um, it's a challenge for everybody, but um, I think we're pretty optimistic from what we've seen. And um, I'd love to, um, to learn about other experiences that other people have had. 
on, on that note, I believe there's some microphones out there. Are there questions from the audience on the, on one of, on any of these four projects and compelling projects that these organizations have been moving forward? Um, I also would open up to the panel if either any of you have questions for each other. I know you had the opportunity to um, look at what, what each other are doing and some of the opportunities and challenges that you're facing. Um, my question is actually for um, Natalie. And um, I'm just, yeah, I just recently relocated back to Manhattan from being um, in Cape Town, South Africa for seven years. I'm very well aware of the sentiments in South Africa in general. And I just wanted to know if you could comment on how you've managed to um, engage with the activist community and the general public in terms of their perceptions um, about Monsanto you know, providing seed in, in Africa and um, how you've handled those concerns. Thanks, that's a great question. Well, anybody who's researched our company know, knows that there's a lot of different opinions about our company and that we're challenged in that area that you just described a bit, um, and we're taking it really seriously. What I'll say about the partnerships themselves is that we feel that transparency and engagement in, in the communities of the partnerships is really important. So in the WEMA project, the entire intellectual property agreement is on the website of the NGO, all the licensing is, on the NG is given to the NGO, um, the, the government scientists do stakeholder outreach to the community, so we're trying to be very transparent about the project. Um, I think in general though, what we really struggle, and this was a question I was actually gonna ask of Mary or others in the, in the audience who could help. We are part of the, we're the beginning of the food chain essentially. And we sell seed to farmers, and they plant it and harvest it, and they sell grain to a grain processor who sells it to a food manufacturer, who sells it to a retailer or a restaurant that gets to the consumer. So our customer is the farmer, and we're really quite removed from consumers. Um, but we're part of the food value chain, and that's a really important responsibility. And it's very important that we're engaging and trying to be transparent about that. And we've worked. Um, in the last couple of years, made a lot of progress, I think, um, in terms of our reporting. Um, there's people in the room here that have been very helpful in our journey on that, and we're continuing to grow. I can tell you right now, we're kind of in the thick of it. I suppose every company has that time where um, you're, you know, more folks in the company are starting to really understand what this really means. And someone brought up the word culture. Um, that's where it really has to get to. And we're, we're going through that evolution right now. Um, a big part of the challenge for us, though, is figuring out how do we effectively engage with these end consumers when we don't have natural marketing or communication programs to reach them. Um, of course, social media is an opportunity. And that's one that we're starting to really ramp up and try to understand better, um, both to get you know, information out and answer questions, but also to get information in and um, doing that all different ways, whether it's in, you know, one-to-one -one meetings or some sort of surveys and different things. So it is a great question. It's something that we take really seriously and have a lot of learning to do, and we're really interested if folks have ideas or, um, you know, ideas that have worked for them. It's also just interesting. You know, we advise our clients often that you want to, you want to, and we've heard a lot about this, aligning your philanthropic and your engagement efforts in your communities around your business strategy. How do you develop this? And, but there are, uh, there are repercussions, and, and it's, a balance, it's a very fine line to walk, um, especially when you're engaging in communities around you know, what is it that, and gaining the trust of communities uh, with moving forward. Scott? Yeah, and it's also about shared value, which, to, your, to your point. And I think that's with any partnership, though. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and internally uh, with my company, one of the things that I, I strive for is not being, uh, is choosing the right partner so that it requires very little convincing mm -hmm. internally. You know, whoever the uh, people that will be the, the touch points for the company or in the community, they shouldn't need our convincing that there's shared value there. Mm -hmm. um, that's typically when these partnerships run into a train wreck. So. You know, the partnerships that, uh, where there's common agreement that there's real value here, this is when they go, they have a long life and there's, um, you know, it's, it's a win for both sides. Well, uh, Scott, you talked about some, you talked about the, when that isn't in alignment. Can you describe an opportunity or can the panelists describe an opportunity of when we're not in alignment, challenge? 
before you can all describe that, <laughs> you're just picking on me. <laughs> you know, well, one of the things that we had to do a few years ago was to build our own rubric. So we have a, uh, you know, we have a, um, if you want to partner with us, we now have a filter you have to go through at, that's very specific. We want to know how quickly there will be shared value, how, how many, how large is the web of, of a network, a spider web of a network that we will be able to build with you. Will it touch all areas within our company? Will it touch multiple layers in the community? We need very specific um, proof points that there's real value. Our art is just a no-go, and we've had, we've had several that we entered into a partnership with that you know, it just didn't last very long because um, either we weren't very good at due diligence or maybe, maybe the expectations weren't all met very yeah, quickly alignment because wasn't there. Because back to the earlier <laughs> point too, I think the uh, quick wins, incremental wins, these things are very important. So you've got to have some stage gates in there. And once they're in, it's pretty easy then to say we have to walk away. I would echo that and just say that the more transparent you can be in establishing any program up front, the better off you're going to be. One of the biggest groups you have to convince is your employees. Yeah. And having been in operations in other parts of my life and having been at the headquarters group, the worst thing you can say is, hey, I'm from headquarters. I'm here, for, here to help. <laughs> you know, and nobody <laughs> believes that. Nobody. And so getting buy-in at the local level and from the, the employees who actually end up living with it or going home and explaining to their families why we're doing something, it's got to make sense to them. And so if that bulletin board test can be passed and you get buy-in, from that group, and like you were saying, Natalie, that is one of your end user groups, is your own employees. Mm -hmm. And if your employees see the end of the value chain as being important because you're at the front of it, um, then you have at least that small stake in the ground to help establish that program more broadly uh, through the company. And I agree with Scott that having immediate gains, midterm gains, and long-term gains that you can identify and continue to talk about for all of your stakeholder groups is going to help you to not only be successful in the long term, but to keep the momentum going. And that's something that we find too. It's really easy to start something, but then keeping it going with, you know, we have a staff of two for the whole company. So keeping things going really requires people out there who are engaged and excited about it and are willing to take it into the community and have the community get behind it as well, so that, that helps us a lot. Thank you. Um, on that keeping it going piece, uh, a strategy that I also, that I often adopted uh, when I was at the city was trying to make sure that there was a champion and a, within the department or somewhere within the organization because uh, corporate responsibility or sustainability teams are often two, three, four person teams and making sure that there's someone willing or, or, or a department within the organization willing to adopt that and take it on uh, as a value proposition for them helped alleviate that. Uh, any final words from our panelists? I just said that it is about the culture. Um, the points about the culture is so true and I would add that it's the statistics show that it's 10 percent of the population is super green um, just to stick with green but I, I think you know share that value and social responsibility point. and then about a third like it, but wouldn't go out of their way for it. And then there's the bottom, and that over time, those, those numbers are increasing. But the, but the challenge is, how do you get that 90%? How do you get that 30%? How do you get the, so it's not about getting the top 10%, because they're there, and they're, they're, they're already doing what they can do. It's about sparking and inspiring that other part of the population because you need all of them in order to achieve the goals that I think everybody in this room wants to achieve. And I think that having some sort of a longer term plan stepwise with discrete metrics, discrete measurable outcomes, that's the sort of thing that gets that 90% um, on your side and then it just builds momentum um, from there. So that is uh, uh, it's culture, it comes to culture and how do you infuse this sentiment, this, this passion factor into the mm -hmm. culture? And, and you know, organizations like the Nature Conservatory, people love it. It's beautiful. You can see what you're doing with the New York Restoration Project. You can just go and see the tree. It's something that's living and breathing right outside your door. It means something to people. And that, once you get them engaged around one thing, then you actually open them up. I don't know if you found this too, but you unleash them. 
once you capture them, then you just have to get out of their way. <laughs> you don't necessarily know where that feeling is going to take them. Sometimes it's uncontrollable. I guess that's another one of the challenges. Right? Um, <laughs> it is a challenge. But it's once you capture them and point them in some sort of direction, then they can take it on beyond what you could even have hoped for. Um, and I think that is really part of the challenge and the opportunity going forward. Leading back to what we heard earlier today, the culture eats strategy for lunch. So, mm -hmm. so. Uh, <laughs> Thank you all very much, and let's give our panelists a round of applause.